Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off long forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Shanti, and, and uh, for the invitation, and, and and thank you to all the co-hosts as well, and everybody that's uh, that's joining us here over Zoom. I know we all do a lot of this Zoom stuff these days, and it gets a bit tiring. So I appreciate uh, uh, you coming out for the talk. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Uh, so hopefully this will all work well. And Yes, that's fine. Right. So hopefully now you all see yes. my uh, my presentation and not my notes. Uh, yes. uh, so um, well, thank you again, and and I'm I'm very happy to 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 be here uh, today uh, to to or well to be sharing this online space with you today uh, to talk about a a topic that's uh, very close to my heart, which is the uh, uh, the role of technology in human evolution. Right. So uh, to give some background, you know, if you were to think maybe uh, 60 years ago, it was a, a pretty mainstream kind of thing to assume that uh, tool making uh, is uh, absolutely central to human evolution. Right. And maybe it even it kind of is, is sort of definitive of, of what our species is and how we're different from other species. Uh, you know, you can see this, uh, you know, in popular media, this is graphically uh, represented in the 1968 film, uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, which depicts uh, this turning point uh, in human evolution as being this moment of insight uh, when an Australopithecine realizes that he can use a bone uh, as a club and then proceeds to slaughter his rivals and, and, and take over. Uh, and from then on, and this is a movie portrays that our future is basically inevitable, this insight. Um, and then, you know, he tosses the bone up in the air and triumph. Uh, you know, it spins through the air and on the way down, it, it transforms into a space station, you know, nice and smoothly the way uh, cinematography worked in the 1960s. But you get you get the picture. So as soon as you have these this tool making and tool use, our future uh, progress is is inevitable. Um, However, uh, even by the time this movie uh, came out, uh, this vision of, uh, you know, man, the tool maker um, was already uh, starting to unravel. Um, as Lewis Leakey put it uh, after Jane Goodall's 1963 report that chimpanzees make and use tools, uh, now we must redefine man, redefine tool or accept chimpanzees as human. All right, so of course we now know that it's not just the chimpanzees. Um, so if you're willing to accept something like uh, hiding in a uh, in a coconut shell as being an example of tool use, then we can even extend tool use to invertebrates like the octopus. Right. Uh, furthermore, archaeology now tells us that the invention of early stone tools uh, was not a transformative breakthrough that changed everything. Um, the first stone tools are now thought to uh, appear about 3.3 uh, million years ago, and then nothing happened for like, you know, seven or 800,000 years. Uh, so actually, the graph should look more like this, uh, a little flash in the pan at 3.3, um, some scattered uh, evidence, some sort of low intensity uh, uh, tool making it uh, two and a half million years ago. And then things only really took off with lots of sites and continuous uh, 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 technological evidence after about two million years ago. Um, so this starts to maybe early stone tools were not really such a big thing, such a big deal after all. Uh, so obviously, if you know my work, I don't believe that. Uh, 
Um, qualitatively, you know, you could say something like, well, uh, the chimpanzee probe here and the phone, while well, they're both tools, so, you know, humans and chimpanzees both have tool use, um, but clearly there's a massive difference in complexity um, that we need to explain between human technology and chimpanzee tool use. Um, so how did we actually get where we are today? So take this scene, for example, from the uh, famous Shibuya crossing in Tokyo. Um, arguably, there's not a single natural thing in sight. Uh, even the, uh, the bodies of the people um, have been transformed uh, by our long reliance on technology. Um, you know, from reduction in the jaws and teeth and guts uh, through external processing of food to our uh, manipulative hands and arms, um, and of course, the, the large uh, en energy hungry brain. Um, but the other thing to look at in this picture is, is how many people there are. Uh, despite the fact that humans with our big, fancy, expensive brains uh, take longer to mature um, and much more parental support, um, as those of you who have kids may appreciate, uh, there are more than 7 billion of us uh, on the planet and the other apes are almost gone. So despite these massive costs, human women have the shortest interbirth interval and highest total, total fertility of all of the apes. Human mothers should not really be able to afford this, uh, if you think of this rate of reproduction. Um, and the reason that they can is because they receive uh, support from others, uh, fathers, grandparents, siblings, other members of the community, and so on, in what some researchers have termed a human biocultural reproductive strategy. Um, for this to be possible, of course, for this uh, helping from others, um, the, those others must be producing more than the bare minimum that they themselves need uh, to survive. All right, so they have to be producing a, some kind of surplus. Uh, chimpanzees basically don't do this. Um, and if you look here, what you're seeing is that the production and the consumption of chimpanzee individuals in terms of uh, calories per day, they track each other very closely, except for a little bit of a, of a deficit when they're very young and they're nursing, right? So there is no real surplus there to support subsidizing the reproductive effort, efforts of others. Um, humans, on the other hand, they have this long, costly uh, uh, childhood, right, where they're really uh, consuming a lot more than they're producing. But at some point, they catch up and actually start over uh, producing. They're producing a surplus. Uh, and this is this surplus, which makes our entire reproductive strategy, our entire way of life possible, uh, is enabled by culturally accumulated knowledge and skills. In other words, what I would call uh, technology, right? So this produces a powerful biocultural feedback cycle uh, where technology increases production, uh, which enables sharing, uh, which, uh, which supports and subsidizes uh, long lifespans, extended development and population growth, which allows this extended development, uh, allows for uh, building a larger brain uh, and, and heavy investments in learning, um, which enables further technical elaboration and so on and, and so on, right? and a kind of feedback cycle. Um, so this suggests, this feedback cycle suggests that once this process here gets started, it should lead to, you know, to runaway feedback and exponential growth, as you see plotted out in this, in this graph here. Um, so maybe, you know, we actually, that whole thing with the, uh, the Australopithecine throwing the, the, the bone in the air, maybe that's right. Maybe, you know, once you start down this technological path, um, you know, we're headed in this expansive uh, feedback cycle uh, after all. Um, but actually, if you think about it, um, this kind of uh, feedback is not inevitable. Um, not every single innovation is going to lead to a kind of a game changing increase in productive productivity. Um, brain growth could favor a refinement rather than innovation and so on. Uh, and in fact, you know, when you do this sort of modeling that produced this, this curve here, um, when you take a lot of uh, these different variables into account, it's possible that, that sometimes it produces a pattern more like this of stability, rapid change and stability, uh, punctuated kind of, uh, of, of pattern that's actually a lot more like what we see in the archaeological record. 
So unfortunately, it's not this simple runaway feedback thing. It's actually complicated. And in order to figure out what actually happened in, uh, in the past, um, we have to do actual archaeology um, to sort out what happened, when, and why. All right. So to achieve this uh, better understanding, I advocate uh, an approach that I like to call evolutionary neuroscience. Um, the most established part of this um, is the comparison between uh, extant species, the comparative method in evolutionary biology. Um, and this can help us to understand what exactly has evolved uh, in humans that's different from our closest relatives um, and possibly even to triangulate back um, to likely points uh, of change and, and causes of divergence between different species. Um, now the, the problem, of course, with this, however, is that a lot of what's really interesting, what we want to know, you know, language and sophisticated technology and all, the, all this sort of thing we're actually interested, has all happened since uh, the split with our closest relatives. And so this comparative method can only take you so far. Um, you know, humans really are idiosyncratic in a lot of ways. Um, so it, to address these particulars, which are mostly what we're interested in, um, you actually need to have more direct evidence of what happened in the past. So this could be physical remains of, of bodies and, and crania. Um, it could be the direct sort of archaeological evidence of, of past behavior, um, the environmental contexts in which this occurred, as far as we construct it, the way in which uh, developmental patterns uh, have changed over time, which you can maybe get at from the paleontology a little bit. Uh, and also, because these things don't speak for themselves, you know, the rocks, what do they mean? Um, you've got to have these sort of uh, analogical sources of, of ethnographic and experimental evidence as well to help you interpret um, what you're finding in the archaeological record. So uh, my colleagues and I have previously drawn on this sort of range of uh, evidence to argue um, that in human evolution, something that one of the very important things that happened um, was an elaboration of this, uh, this connect, these connections between the parietal cortex and the, the frontal cortex. Uh, the, the tract involves is, is the uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus. Um, but we've argued that this uh, frontoparietal connectivity, which supports systems for action planning and control, um, is a key substrate for the, the evolutionary and developmental construction of modern human culture and cognition. Um, and that it provides a foundation both for refined action control by the self, um, but also for learning from the observed actions of others and inferring intentions from their behavior. Um, so I'm going to be talking a lot today about uh, behavior um, but remember that what I'm going to want it, to relate it back to is the evolution of this uh, frontoparietal uh, perception action system here in the human brain. Uh, so the good news for evolutionary neuroscience uh, is that there has been a recent proliferation of experimental studies of stone tool making cognition. Uh, these have generally focused either on trying to understand um, the neurocognitive mechanisms um, that support tool making and tool use uh, using neuroimaging and behavioral paradigms, um, or they, they focus on the, the possible role of, of teaching and language uh, in the social transmission of Paleolithic technology uh, using paradigms like uh, transmission chains where one person teaches one, another person, that person teaches the next generation and so on and so on. Um, or and or uh, under different teaching conditions, especially, for instance, teach, uh, uh, learning to make tools uh, with or without verbal instruction from, uh, from a teacher. Right, so that's the good news. The bad news uh, is that stone tool making skill is still very hard to study experimentally. Uh, stone napping is a real world skill uh, and it takes a lot of time, effort, and materials to learn it. Uh, it involves a huge number of variables that are hard to control without fundamentally altering the task. You know, the more of this complexity that you try to control in the lab, less, the less it's like actual tool making uh, out in the world. And so people have uh, tried to manage these trade-offs by using for instance, standardized but inauthentic raw materials like bricks, uh, 
or using uh, uh, instruction that is video recorded rather than live. So everybody sees exactly the same thing, but what they're seeing is on a screen and very different from reality uh, and, and so on. Um, but the, the, the big one that people have manipulated is this question of, of training time versus sample size. Um, so for instance, uh, you know, Morgan uh, and colleagues here um, published a very interesting study, a very large study um, they found that uh, there was evidence that verbal instruction uh, aided learning in the transmission uh, of, the, of in a transmission chain experiment. They had 180 participants in five different learning conditions, um, which is great and you know is unprecedented. But every individual only got five minutes to learn the task. Um, so this very short learning period cast some doubt on the, the re, whether the results would generalize to the real world. I mean, maybe this, uh, this advantage would go away if you gave people 20 minutes to figure it out, right? Um, so that's a problem. Uh, on the other hand, you know, studies I've done, uh, we, you know, we studied uh, a group of people for, for two years, um, you know, with the uh, up to 175 hours of, of, of practice and training time, um, but we were only able to do this with six participants in one learning condition, right? So we can't address some of the questions that people are interested in. So there's this real trade-off between the amount of training you provide for people and the sample size you can have and the kinds of questions um, that you can address that we have to try to deal with. Uh, and we do need to address this problem uh, because understanding the costs and demands of learning uh, to make stone tools is critical to understanding patterns of technological evolution. You know, for example, we can return to this question of, of why didn't early stone tool making really take off um, for more than a million years after the first indication that, that hominids could do it. Uh, this pattern uh, puzzles us, uh, we find it counterintuitive, I, I think, because archeologists have something of a bias uh, to think of technological change as progress. Um, but we also know that new technologies come with costs as well as benefits. Um, so there can be a lot of front end costs uh, in gathering raw materials, making and maintaining tools, learning how to make them and use them um, before this actually starts paying off. Those costs have to be paid on the front end. Um, so I'm going to, uh, you know, so sometimes uh, in some circumstances, you would actually be better off just going in with really simple technology rather than spending the time to tool up to something more sophisticated. Um, and I'm going to suggest that this kind of dynamic uh, could help to explain the, the fits and starts of, of early stone tools. Uh, and in particular, uh, I want to focus on the, uh, uh, the costs of, of skill learning, um, because the, this is something you can work with. This is something that can be influenced by the biocultural evolution of brains um, that are better at learning and by investments in the sharing and time of energy um, that we call teaching um, that, could, that can reduce these skill learning uh, costs for other individuals, All right? So apes. Um, they, as we now know that they, they can be trained uh, to make stone tools, um, but they don't do it in the wild. Um, it also, it takes them a really long time to learn how to make tools. And to be honest, they're really not very good at it. Uh, so it's really no wonder that they don't bother on their own to do this unless you force them to in, in captivity. Um, and, and part of the reason uh, it's hard for them uh, to this is probably simply because the, their, their hands are not um, well suited to it. They have these really long fingers uh, that make the kind of manipulation of, uh, you know, handheld uh, uh, freehand uh, percussion um, to be very difficult. Um, but I think it's more than, than just their hands um, that makes this challenging for, for apes to learn. Oops. So just for reference, I wanted to show you, this is a short video showing you uh, I thought it was anyway. Um, seems to be having. All right, I think we're gonna miss the uh, video today. Sorry, but uh, uh, basically, hopefully, many of you have have seen this uh, before. Um, you know, and what happens is you're manipulating the rock in, in one hand and, and striking it with the other. And what is uh, 
uh, most evident usually in the video, people who haven't watched this before, is these, you know, highly accurate uh, uh, strikes um, with the, uh, the dominant hand. Um, but what is a little more subtle is the amount of fine manipulation that, that's done in accurately positioning and supporting uh, the core to receive uh, the blow with the non-dominant hand. Um, so in a simple thing like old one tool making, um, where you're just trying to produce flakes, um, the strategy here is not very complicated, um, but the perceptual motor demands are actually quite high. Um, and so it takes some investment in, in time to acquire this skill. Um, so as I was suggesting, it's not just, I mean, you, you, you can see that the manipulation by the hands is very important, uh, but I think it's not just the hands, but also the brain and the way that it's wired that makes this difficult for apes. Um, so this brings us back to the, uh, the, the frontal parietal system that I told you I was going to return to. Um, and, you know, comparative work shows that compared to chimpanzees, uh, human have a, have a much expanded uh, frontal parietal uh, pathway here um, that connects sort of the, uh, the, the visual cortices in the, uh, in the back of the brain with, uh, with parietal cortex um, involved in, rep in representing uh, spatial relations, allocating spatial attention, uh, movement kinematics, representing the body and its place in space, um, and communicating us with the so-called executive cortex uh, in the frontal lows, which are involved in action planning. Um, and you can see these the, the same areas that are better connected um, uh, and uh, have added functions in humans versus chimpanzees are the same regions that humans in any case appear to rely on heavily even when they're doing simple stone tool making. Um, so our uh, 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 our previous studies of uh, neuroimaging of stone tool making have highlighted this frontal parietal system, which appears to be evolutionarily elaborated uh, in humans. And you know the reason why we're uh, you know I, I think that this is such a a, a big deal um, is that this system is uh, important not just for uh, controlling your own execution of actions, uh, but also for imitation. So, uh, you know, as depicted here in this diagram, there's uh, at least two ways that you can try to figure out and copy what somebody is doing if you see them do it, right? So let's say they're just picking up a, a, a mug and, and drinking coffee, right? And so um, first you might use general semantic knowledge about the world and the way it works, you know, like you, you know that, for instance, uh, what a cup is, that they often contain coffee and that we both like to drink coffee. Um, and then you infer from this sort of general knowledge that if I'm picking up the cup, I'm probably uh, going doing that because I want to drink coffee. And if you want to imitate me, you would say, well, that was their goal was to pick up the cup and drink coffee. And now I'll figure out my own way to achieve that goal. So, you know, you might grab the, uh, uh, the cup by the handle, you know, and I just grab it like this, or I might, you know, stick my pinky finger out while I'm dr drinking. So I would be pursuing the same goal, goal but inventing my own way of achieving it. Um, and the other way to, to copy and understand something that you see um, is to actually internally simulate uh, the actions that you're observing. Um, so I see you reach for the cup and I internally simulate what it would be like if I were moving my body that way. I imagine that I, how I would make exactly the same movement. And I infer from that, you know, if I were making that movie, movement, what I would be doing is trying to pick up the, uh, the, the cup and drink uh, coffee. Uh, and in this case, this allows you, if you're going to copy the movement, to copy exactly the same action and use the same methods. Um, and it's this form of copying uh, through uh, internal simulation that's supported by the, the, uh, the, the frontal parietal systems that, that I keep mentioning, right? And again, this is considered by many to be quite a big deal because a lot of people think that this kind of detailed copying of specific behavioral means rather than just general action goals um, is a, a critical support uh, that enables our high fidelity cultural transmission, um, which in turn is what allows for human cumulative culture, or in other words, our ability to keep building on past inventions 
uh, to the point that we've got all this stuff around us that no one could even invent in their own uh, lifetime. And, you know, that many of us who make and use it don't even really understand how it works. It's just accumulated over time. Um, and this is what Joe Henrik in his uh, 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 way with words calls the, uh, the, the secret of our success, right? This human cumulative culture supported by high fidelity cultural transmission, possibly supported by our ability to accurately reproduce uh, actions that we observe, right? So going back then to our evolutionary narrative, we said we're stuck with these, you know, early apes not making stone tools, too challenging for them, not worth the investment. Uh, what about australopithecines? Um, so we still, we're still talking about small brains, big jaws and teeth, uh, hands and arms that may not have been precisely suited to the task. And for them as well, stone tool making may simply not have been worth it very often to do. Um, the exception that proves the rule here, of course, is the, uh, the Lamequian. Um, which was made actually uh, using less demanding techniques like indirect percussion against a stationary block um, or bipolar shattering on an anvil um, that require much less control and dexterity. So as you can see here, the experimenter has actually taped his uh, fingers together uh, to prove this point that you can do this without a lot of uh, fine uh, control of the hands. Um, so this technology would then require less investment in skill and dexterity, um, but maybe also produce less of a payoff with a less efficient uh, uh, technology. Uh, and so again, it doesn't seem to have widely uh, uh, caught on under a lot of circumstances this, this early. And, and, and we, well, in fact, we only have one example um, for another seven or 800,000 years. Um, and it's only after that that we start to pick up more evidence of tool making with a uh, small cluster of sites that have been uh, excavated in the uh, Gona project area in Ethiopia, where I've been fortunate to work with uh, Dr. Seleshi Sema. Um, and here we have evidence for uh, more refined uh, freehand tool making methods, uh, indicating a greater investment in skill acquisition. Um, but these occurrences are still ephemeral and infrequent um, with big gaps in the record. Um, we do know, we know, we know actually very little about uh, early homo at this time, um, except that maybe the, the teeth look a little bit smaller. Maybe the brains would have been bigger too, but we just don't know that right now. Um, Australopithecines who are around at the right time and place uh, to make these tools uh, don't show any apparent adaptations uh, uh, to tool use either, right? So we have uh, uh, a more skill intensive uh, uh, way of making these stone tools is perhaps more efficient in the long run once you make that investment in skill acquisition. We're not really sure what the makers uh, looked like. Um, and then really though, it's only after 2 million years ago that Olduan sites actually uh, become more widespread uh, larger and longer lasting, um, what you might call sort of a habitual uh, production of, of, of tools at this point. Um, but, and the record is still complex, but there is a curious coincidence between this sort of onset of habitual uh, tool making and the emergence of, uh, of larger bodies and, 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 and brain sizes at this time as well. You know, and once that has happened, then very shortly after, you know, this is where we're finally starting to look at something that acts like some kind of feedback. Is very shortly thereafter, by about uh, 1.8 million, we have the invention of uh, new, more sophisticated technology um, that involves the intentional shaping of tools um, that we call hand axes and picks. Um, among other things, this includes uh, novel techniques for striking very large flakes from boulder cores, um, which seems to go hand in hand with the, the larger uh, body and, and, and brain and expanded uh, range of Homo erectus. And this adaptation seems to be very flexible and stable, uh, uh, allowing hominids either with or without hand axe technology to inhabit uh, diverse uh, environments throughout uh, Eurasia. Um, in places where hand axes, like East Africa, in places where hand axes were made consistently through this time, um, there is some evidence of uh, incremental refinement uh, through time. 
Um, but overall, things are pretty stable for a million years or more. By 500,000 years ago, however, we do see clear evidence of another period of rapid change. Um, so uh, this includes uh, further encephalization, uh, as well as habitat expansion and new technologies. Um, one I've studied in some detail are the uh, late Acheulean hand axes from sites like Boxgrove in the UK, uh, which in contrast to uh, earlier forms uh, show very fine shaping and especially these, uh, uh, this cross-sectional thinning um, that reflect the invention of new uh, napping techniques, new tool making uh, techniques used to achieve these refined uh, effects. Uh, Oh, well, here's, here's a video that works. Uh, um, so the, the, the challenge with this technology um, is that you need to, you often have to start with a very uh, thick or irregular uh, nodule uh, or starting point like this, and you have to thin it down in cross section. Um, and to do this, uh, you have to strike very controlled flakes that then they must travel more than halfway across the surface of the piece. They must cross uh, the midline uh, in order to actually reduce it in, in cross section. Because if you only take from the edge, you never are touching the middle, it's never going to get thinned at all. Um, and to do this, um, you must not, you, you, for one, you have to be very accurate in your application of force, um, but also you oftentimes have to engage in a series of, of preparatory flaking actions um, that are going to adjust the location and bevel of this edge into just the right configuration um, that's going to allow the, the flake to, to travel a greater distance across the core surface. And also all of this complexity results in a much more complicated goal hierarchy. You're not just, you know, smash, smash, flake, smash, smash, flake, you know, rotate, smash, flake, you know, uh, as you do to, in basic flake production. I mean, at this point in time, there is there a structure where you're actually setting something up in advance, performing another a number of steps in order to achieve a goal. Um, and all of this is, is, is united into higher levels of goals like shaping and thinning and, and so forth. So a more complex structure of goals in the production of, uh, of hand axes. Now, I don't know if this, yeah. So this one's actually going to work um, for whatever reason. So here's an example, this is Bruce Bradley actually, many of you will know of um, making a hand ax in a, uh, a rather large spall of, of flint. Um, and the, the point of this is uh, to show that uh, there is a, a complex chaining of actions. So what he's doing, if, if you're not familiar with hand axe production right here, um, what he's going to need to do is, is, is remove this big thick area back there to thin it, right? So you may wonder why he's just dinking around, taking little flakes off this edge here. But what he's actually doing is creating a different kind of angle and a surface that he can strike to produce flakes that will go into the middle there. So, right? so he did a whole bunch of preparation before uh, moving in for that one blow that removed part of the area he was trying to get rid of. All right, and you see he's also, again, working here on an edge that he's uh, prepared, uh, switching between different percussors that are appropriate to different uh, uh, sub goals. And, you know, oftentimes removing smaller pieces, he's establishing an edge here. Um, this is part of the technique, uh, you know, that gives us the term bifacial, right? Where he's going back and forth and almost this kind of stitching uh, technique to create the centered edge. And once he's going to manage, this is a sort of a sub goal of creating this centered edge all the way around the piece. It's going to give him control over the geometry. And that's when he can then do the, the, the thinning. Um, so again, you can see a much more elaborate relationship. Here he's identified a, a, a problem area on the core. Um, the angles are not uh, quite what he needs them to be. I mean, I don't know if he, you can see that there's sort of a, a bulging area right there um, that he's trying to get rid of, but he doesn't have a good angle. So he's gonna back off from that and work into it from a place where he has a little bit better angle. If he can remove just a few millimeters of rock there, uh, he can establish the striking platform that he needs and there and now he succeed in removing a uh, flake that's gonna actually thin the piece down. Um, so again, I've been talking 
narrating you through some of sort of the relationship between goal structures, but you also will have noted that um, the tolerance for error is a lot less there. The fineness of the, uh, the control and the accuracy that's required is much higher. So it's both perceptual, motorly, cha motorically challenged and uh, uh, cognitively uh, more complex action sequence involved. So what we wanted to do is actually get uh, an uh, uh, empirical experimental uh, perspective on, on the actual learning challenges um, and the level of investment in learning that's implied by this technology when we start to see performance like this, you know, half a million years ago. Um, so what we did is we, we conducted a study um, with about 20 people previously inexperienced learning how to make hand axes. Their explicit goal was to produce hand axes similar to those from uh, Boxgrove. Um, Nada Krisha, uh, an expert stone toolmaker who trained uh, with Bruce Bradley, um, was responsible for, uh, for teaching these individuals. We were able to provide them with up to 90 hours of uh, practice and hands-on instruction each. Uh, and uh, uh, Justin Pargeter was, uh, joined the project later and was responsible for analyzing the artifacts that were produced by these uh, participants. Right, to take full advantage of this expensive and labor-intensive training experiment, uh, and I told you like, one of the big things about studying technologies like this is it takes so much effort and time to actually train people. So we're, we finally were going to do this with a reasonable sample of, of 20 people, and we wanted to maximize what we got out of it. So we, we collected a lot of additional data from the participants um, with the aim of identifying the, uh, the neural, cognitive, and behavioral foundation of individual differences in learning. As you know, what makes one person succeed better at learning this task than another? For instance, is it something about their patterns of, of brain activity or the structure of their brain? Um, you know, something you could pick up with cognitive tests of things like working memory. Um, is it the, the way in which they, they approach learning, their, the behaviors they, they display in interacting with teach, teachers? You know, can, is it something about their, their individual practice habits and, and so forth? We even looked at their, their language skills. Um, and so we collected all these data about individuals, uh, but the critical thing that you have to have um, is something to compare that with. And, and we need to have an actual quantitative objective measure of just tool making skill. You know, we, we can quantify, oh, you know, their brain has, you know, in, in great detail, um, but how good were their hand eggs? How much did they learn? How do you say individual one or individual two uh, learn more. And this is actually a major methodological challenge uh, for experimental neuroarchaeology. Um, so, I mean, look at, you know, so here are uh, hand axes that were produced by the uh, participants. I mean, you know, clearly you'll look at these and you'll say some of them look better than others. You know, like, oh, you know, I mean, this one's not bad. This, were they even trying to make a hand axe? I, I don't know. You know. Um, but can you put a number on that? You know, I mean, is this a, you know, is this a, a 2.3 and this one's a five? Um, how would you do that? And that's what we need to do if we're going to actually compare skill learning and, and track development. So what we did to try to address this methodological challenge uh, was to try to leverage the subjective expertise of the instructor who, after all, knew what she was trying to get them to do. She was the teacher, right? Um, and so what, what she did, what Nada did, was to give each participant a skill assessment after every 10 hours of training. And she would observe them trying to make a hand ax and carefully rate their performance using a standardized rubric of different things that she was looking for. Um, what we then did, but the problem with that, of course, is you can't do that in the past. Right. Uh, so what we did, we wanted to get at this from just the things that they produced, just the artifacts that were comparable to what you would find in the archaeological record. Um, so what we did is we used a machine learning algorithm um, to try, to try to reproduce her ratings of performance purely from the metric attributes of the, uh, the artifacts that people produce, you know, like all the, uh, their, their linear dimensions, things like the extent that's biofacially worked, on flaked area, a bunch of stuff like that. And we threw all that into this machine learning uh, algorithm. Um, and this, this produced a model um, that allowed us to approximate with, you know, reasonable reliability 
uh, the kind of rating that an actual expert observer would have given to somebody if they could watch them making this thing. Um, and so that's really nice. And furthermore, it's just from the material remains. I, it is at this point completely objective because now it really is just from the measurements uh, and it provides a very continuous rating of the quality of each hand axe. Um, so we use this method um, then to uh, quantify and study this, the skill learning process in our study uh, by plotting out uh, increases in uh, hand axe quality uh, over the course of training in our group of learners. Um, and so what we found is this class, this is a really classic power learning curve that you find in all kinds of things from, uh, from learning to trace it when you're looking in a mirror or just rotor pursuit tasks. You know, even I think cigar rolling study they did uh, uh, showed this kind of power learning uh, uh, thing where you, you, what happens is you show initially um, very rapid gains. You know, you start at zero and you get better fast. Uh, and then things become much slower. You kind of plateau off and you have to work harder and harder for each subsequent increment in, in performance. And, you know, maybe you've had this experience yourself trying to learn some kind of skill or sport or something like that. At first it's great, uh, but then it gets harder and harder to keep improving. Um, so, so that was a very nice finding, which at least we you know it, it's what we, you would like to expect to find in a study like this. Uh, uh, but life being what it is, what it is we also had a, a good deal of variation um, in how often participants were able to make it in for practice. You know, we set out with the objective of, of, of controlling this completely, you know, and everybody does the same number of hours and same frequency and that kind of thing, you know, but people have lives and, and over the course of months, things happen and they can't make it for training, for instance. Uh, so we did have quite a bit of variation that you can see here, even in the total number of hours people got and how rapidly um, they got there. And, but this was, you know, the silver lining of this is we, it allowed us to, to find that it's not just the number of hours that you log um, that, that result in increased performance. It's actually the concentration of practice. So we found a, a, a good effect of uh, practice density. You know, so clustering your practice together and sticking with it um, results in better, more rapid uh, increases um, than, than spacing out your practice more widely. Uh, so clustered or dense practice is more uh, effective in learning a skill like this, which is something that we can think about in terms of what that implies about, uh, you know, uh, uh, behavior in the past. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, that you know our sc our scale actually had five points, and we didn't even go up to five on this uh, this chart because ninety hours of practice, um, even with you know a, an expert instructor hands on right there with you, was not nearly enough um, for almost any of the participants to achieve Boxgrove like uh, competence in hand axe making. Uh, you know, what we could do because we did have this quantification and, and all of the hours for individuals is we could extrapolate their individual learning curves um, and, 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 and estimate how long it would have taken them to get to a five. Uh, and our estimate there, the extrapolated time to master varied widely across individuals um, from 121 hours to, to over 400 hours that would be required to achieve mastery. Um, so that's very interesting to think about how much variation that is uh, under the, just the same uh, learning conditions. Um, and that kind of variation is the sort of thing you might expect evolution uh, to work on. Um, so we wanted to know more exactly what it was that participants were learning um, that improved their performance. You know, what was actually changing as they got better at making, as their hand axes started to look better. Um, so to, to put a finer point on it, you know, as you can see in the slide, archaeologists uh, widely conceptualize skilled performance as being some combination of uh, accurate uh, perceptual motor execution or know-how uh, and of a sort of more abstract uh, strategic and problem-solving knowledge about what to do. Um, so what we wanted to ask is, you know, what are the relative contributions of know-how and knowledge to early stage anyway, hand ax making skill acquisition. Uh, and to address this, uh, we adapted an earlier experiment from uh, Nanaka and uh, Blondine Brill and others um, 
where uh, nappers were with varying degrees of experience were instructed um, to draw on the core the outline of the flake uh, that they intended to remove before they hit it, including uh, you know a dot where they intended to actually hit the core, um, and and then to actually try to do it. And so, what this uh, method, uh, what this protocol allows you to do, is to measure both um, the knowledge of how stone breaks that's reflected in the viability of the predictions. Um, that they make, um, as well as their, their know-how sort of accuracy in actually hitting the things that they aim for with the right amount of force to produce the flake that they predicted. And you can measure the deviations in both cases, right? Um, so we applied this method in our study uh, by having participants predict and draw the first five flakes uh, in an attempt at hand axe production. Uh, we allowed them three strikes for each prediction to detach a flake. If they couldn't do it in three strikes, we called that trial a, a failure. And as you can see here, then that would allow us to actually see the difference, for instance, between where they said they were gonna hit it and where they did, what they thought the platform would look like and what it actually looked like and so forth. So we found initially anyway, that, uh, uh, that is the simple ability to successfully detach flakes in this paradigm, you know, to, to get something off when you have three chances, um, follows a very similar learning curve to overall hand axe quality. So, you know, they start off actually only a little bit better than half of the time to actually produce any flake at all. And then there's a rapid increase in something of a plateau and they never get to, uh, to expert, uh, uh, levels of performance within the, within the study. Um, but digging a little deeper, what's very interesting here is that uh, this, uh, these difficulties do not seem to be, uh, and these changes don't seem to be due to changes in the ability to predict, to make reasonable predictions of viable flakes um, uh, that respect the, the known principles of fracture mechanics. So the novices here in black um, respect the same kind of relationship between the, the platform angle and the size and shape of the flake that, that comes off. They have th these slopes uh, between the novices in black and the experts in red are indistinguishable, right? So both of these groups in novices, even from the beginning, are sort of appreciating the way in which the geometry of the stone works. Um, it does seem that experts uh, uh, do expect longer flakes in general um, from their performance. Uh, but so there's not a lot of evidence for a difference in understanding how the rock breaks or knowledge about fracture mechanics, intuitive knowledge. Uh, um, but instead, uh, what seems to make a real difference is just being able to hit what you're aiming for. All right, so what you see here is the error distance uh, between the predicted point of impact and the actual point of impact clearly and significantly decreasing across training and clearly at, the, at its lowest level uh, in experts. Um, so novices fail apparently because it's hard to realize a plan, even if it's a good plan, if you just keep missing what you're aiming for, All right? Um, but what's really fascinating about this is this increased accuracy is not just about perceptual motor coordination. It actually reflects this interaction between knowledge and know-how. Um, learners become more accurate, not just because they're practicing and, 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 and acquiring greater accuracy, um, but also because they're changing their strategy uh, to compensate for their limited abilities. And what they're doing, as you can see, is they, they proceed uh, uh, from early to middle to late, is they're targeting smaller, thinner flakes that require less force to detach. And the less force you have to apply, the more you can slow down your percussion, right? And make it easier to control. So this works to produce flakes, which is important for them because they're having trouble even doing that. Um, but unfortunately it doesn't work very well to produce a nice thin hand ax, right? Which you need uh, these bold invasive flaking to get the thinning going, which is what you see in the, the experts, both their predictions and their, their actual flakes. And the novice performance throughout remains a far cry from that. And so that sort of explains why we get this increase, but then they hit a plateau, 
where they, they may know what they need to do, but they're still unable to actually uh, achieve it here. And so they've sort of stalled out while they're still needing to further develop just their basic motor accuracy to the point where they can actually pursue expert strategies. So I would say that maybe you can make a theoretical distinction um, between knowledge and know-how that might be useful, but in the real world, um, these two are inextricably linked to each other uh, in skilled performance. Um, so what are the neural foundations for this kind of skilled performance? Uh, you won't be surprised that I'm going to return again to this frontal parietal pathway for action control. Um, we found this pathway to be consistently implicated in neuroimaging studies of stone tool making, uh, as indicated by everything from uh, task-related uh, glucose metabolism, when people are actually making stone tools outside the scanner, um, to uh, measurement of, uh, of, of blood flow while people are watching videos of tools being made sitting inside an fMRI scanner. Uh, and even to, uh, to actual uh, training-induced structural changes in the white matter pathways that connect these parietal and frontal regions. So I'll focus uh, uh, here on the, on the white matter uh, structural data um, because I think it provides the most direct link to evolutionary kinds of arguments and changes in brain anatomy. Um, so in an earlier study of stone tool making learning here, this is the one that only had like six participants in it. Um, we found that practice produced structural changes in the superior longitudinal fasciculus. That's that fiber pathway that connects the frontal and the, and the parietal uh, lobes here, inferior frontal. Um, and we found, so we found that the training, just going through the training produced these structural changes. Um, and we also were able to find some correlation between the extent of change in this pathway and changes in accuracy on a, uh, on a laboratory test of, of motor accuracy, uh, this kind of thing where you had to move a robot arm rapidly. Um, but we did not yet have a, a good measure of actual tool making skill that we could compare these changes with to see, you know, are they actually causal or how do they relate to individual variation. Um, so in the more recent study, um, we, because we have that method, we were able to directly compare the neuroanatomy uh, to tool making success measured by our, you know, our quality metric. Uh, and we again found this uh, relationship with white matter connections uh, to the inferior uh, frontal along the superior longitudinal fasciculus that originates in the, uh, in the parietal lobe. Uh, and in fact, the, the strength of these connections in individual participants as they entered the study, so this is for just when they're coming in, before they did anything, we scanned their brains, um, it predicted how well they would do on their very first tool making assessment. So at the outset of training. Uh, so kind of where their brain was when they came into the study produced how well, uh, predicted how well they did at the beginning of, of training. Uh, and you can see this relationship here between uh, the, the, the white matter measure that we use and the, the quality of the tool on their first assessment. Uh, and something that's even more interesting, you'll notice these dots are uh, a different size. Here, right? Um, and what that's indicating is uh, years of prior experience um, with other kinds of gross motor skills, uh, crafts like carpentry or sculpture. Um, so you can see the individuals that had a lot of prior experience using their hands for that sort of, uh, you know, uh, gross motor crafts, uh, they did quite well. Um, interestingly enough, we didn't find any effect um, for some, some finer motor uh, skills that people had like uh, knitting and sewing. Um, but the important thing here is that it, even if you take these people out with their prior experience, you still have a relationship between neuroanatomy and, and, and achievement at, at, at tool making. Right, so it appears that what's important probably about these skills is not the, the actual experience or a transfer of knowledge, it's what having practiced those skills for many years has done to their brains. It has enhanced white matter connections in this superior longitudinal fasciculus and that across whether, whatever the reason for having better connectivity, it correlates 
with producing a better tool on your first go uh, at the beginning of training. So that suggests that really what is happening is that experience is changing neuroanatomy and neuroanatomy is giving you better aptitude at the start of training. Um, I should mention, uh, uh, we didn't find uh, as many uh, uh, training effects at the group level here because we had so much variation in the level of ability that people had when they were coming into the study. Um, so all of it, this is all uh, really exciting to me um, because our comparative anatomical investigations also show that this same pathway, the superior longitudinal fasciculus that I've been talking about, uh, is uh, evolutionarily expanded, the connection, connections in particular to the inferior uh, frontal cortex are expanded in humans relative to what they are in chimpanzees. All right, so this is a system, as I've been saying, that plays a role in action planning, control, and perception, um, which is really enough to be, to be getting on with. Um, but to really think about the, uh, the potential impact on human evolution, you have to think about what these kind of abilities for action planning, control, and perception buy you. Um, so for instance, mirror self-recognition, um, you know, looking in the mirror and knowing that that's you and not another creature, uh, is a classic psychological test of self-awareness in animals. Um, so how exactly do you recognize yourself in a mirror and realize it's not another person? Uh, for that matter, how do you read the body language of another person to tell you something about what they are feeling inside? These kinds of uh, abilities uh, appear to be achieved, as I mentioned earlier, through internal simulation and matching of predicted outcomes with what you actually see happening. Thus, even if you don't know what you look like, you can tell that the image in the mirror is you because when you intend to move, it moves in the way you intended to move your body. And it's thus recognizable as you, as yourself. Your predictions about what your body is going to do are matched by what you see in the mirror. Um, and in the same way, we can use predictions about, well, what I, if I were doing this thing that this other person is doing, I would be you know, waving my hands. That's because I would be trying to get it, attention. And then you can match what you perceive with an inferred goal that's inside that person's head and can't be seen directly, right? So just like skilled stone napping, to do this sort of internal simulation uh, trick, what you need to have are very good internal models of your own body and movements. Uh, and indeed, um, the extent to which chimpanzee frontoparietal connectivity approximates what you see in humans the more human like this is, the more likely they are to succeed at recognizing themselves in a mirror. Thus, these sort of enhancements to bodily awareness and control of skilled action um, supported by the frontal parietal system in humans um, would also, not, would, would not just you know, favor your individual ability to skillfully control your actions, but it also help to support uh, you know, bodily imitation, copying and understanding what you're seeing somebody else doing, uh, and the kind of behavior reading, empathy, and social bonding needed for, you know, effective teaching, you know, through instruction and demonstration, understanding what the, the pupil needs to learn, um, and also the kind of, uh, uh, of social bonding um, that, that makes this whole thing possible, this whole sort of teaching interaction uh, and meaningful connections between individuals. Uh, and so all of this then contributes to the kind of what you need for effective teaching and learning in this sort of broader human technological niche that I started uh, the talk off uh, talking about. So in this context, it is, it is striking to note uh, that evolutionary changes to, to the human uh, frontal parietal connectivity along the superior longitudinal fasciculus uh, are actually paralleled um, quite directly in the effects that stone tool making ha training has on individual brains uh, and that individual differences in this pathway uh, coming into a study actually predict your aptitude at learning to make stone tools. 
Um, so what remains to be seen is whether these uh, uh, species level differences between chimpanzees and humans are the product of uh, you know, genetic evolution of innate brain structures, as would be the usual interpretation of comparative differences, um, or are they actually the developmental consequences of growing up in a technological niche? Um, or again, probably the most likely thing, some complex combination of, 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 of genetic and, and cultural evolution and technological niche construction. So as we've seen, this is a very complex pattern of interacting variables. Um, but hopefully uh, through carefully study, a careful study of the archeological record uh, and uh, focused experimentation, uh, we can begin to sort out the details of this sort of extended process uh, through which modern human uh, technological niche evolved. So, thank you. <laughs>